The gift of Prometheus, our heroic past is the model for our heroic future. Many heroic stories are looked upon as fictional or at best symbolic, but their historical underpinnings are sometimes confirmed with astonishing accuracy. For example, the fabled city of Troy was thought to be a figment of the imagination of the poet Homer until Heinrich Schliemann found it in the 1870s. The same may be true of those beings who awakened human consciousness. Quote, our saviors, the Anishwata and other divine sons of the flame of wisdom personified by, in, by the Greeks in Prometheus may well in the injustice of the human heart be left unrecognized and unthanked, says H.P. Blavatsky in The Secret Doctrine, Volume 2, pages 411 to 412. Prometheus is a mythological figure from ancient Greece. He was a titan who stole fire from the gods, shared it with humanity, and was punished by Zeus, king of the gods, by being shackled to a rock in the Caucasus in which his liver was eaten by a vulture every day and regenerated every night. The fire is symbolic of not only the ability of mankind to keep warm, but the ability to use self-consciousness to modify the world around us. Prometheus is representative of the evolutionary struggle in which we find ourselves. We are septenary beings and Prometheus is the symbol of our mind principle or manas as it's said in Sanskrit. This principle differentiates us from the animal kingdom as it provides the vehicle for knowing who and what we are. It makes us the microcosm in the macrocosm. The awakened mind gives us the freedom to choose between good and evil. The Kabbalah, an ancient source of Jewish mystical tradition, says that a mineral becomes a plant, a plant becomes an animal, an animal becomes a man, and a man becomes a god. However, this grand process of evolutionary unfoldment from within outward, while automatic, below the human state, becomes self-chosen as a result of the mind's ability to choose between its higher and lower states. That is, kamamanis, associated with the desire nature, or buddhimanis, the mind gravitating toward our next higher and spiritual principle. Theosophy is based upon three fundamental propositions, unity, periodicity, and evolution. H.P. Blavatsky refers to the third fundamental of evolution as a pivotal doctrine. The use of this term is reminiscent of the famous statement of Archimedes, the greatest mathematician of antiquity, when he said, give me a lever and a place to stand and I shall move the world. The doctrine is pivotal because it suggests that our progress is chosen individually by each of us through, as she says in the secret doctrine, self-induced and self-devised efforts. This concept is beautifully illustrated by the closing words of Ralph Waldo Emerson's essay, Self-Reliance. He wrote, in the will work and acquire, and thou hast chained the wheel of chance, and shall sit hereafter out of fear of her rotations, a political victory, a rise of rents, the recovery of your sick, or the return of your absent friend, or some other favorable event, raises your spirits, and you think good days are preparing for you. Do not believe it. Nothing can bring you peace but yourself. Nothing can bring you peace but the triumph of principles. 
Consequently, Prometheus is the heroic example or metaphor of the journey that each of us must choose to work with nature and our own higher selves. Joseph Campbell, the author of numerous books on mythology, summarized this path in a conversation with the journalist Bill Moyers in the 1988 television series, The Power of Myth, one of the most popular TV series in the history of public television, which continues to inspire new audiences. He said, we have not even to risk the adventure alone for the heroes of all time have gone before us. The labyrinth is thoroughly known. We have only to follow the thread of the hero path. And where we had thought to find an abomination, we shall find a God. And where we had thought to slay another, we shall slay ourselves. And where we had thought to travel outward, we shall come to the center of our own existence. And where we had thought to be alone, we shall be with all the world. As stated in the Bhagavad Gita, this is a glorious unsought battle. The battle is both internal and external, for as the American humorist and writer Mark Twain has said, nothing is harder to tolerate than the annoyance of a good example. When the story of Prometheus tells us that he is chained to a rock and punished, it is our lower nature, Camomanus, the desire nature, which is responsible. The story of Lucifer is similar in its mythic imagery, and it is for this reason that HPB selected it as the name of her magazine in the 1890s. Lucifer literally means light bringer and he was believed to have been an archangel who was hurled from heaven for wickedness and revolt against God. The Bible refers to him when it says, how you have fallen from the heavens, O shining one, son of morning, Isaiah 14, 12. Yet another example of the pain that comes with awakened consciousness is the story of Tantalus, a Greek mythological figure most famous for his punishment in Tartarus. He was made to stand in a pool of water beneath a fruit tree with low branches, with the fruit ever eluding his grasp and the water always receding before he could take a drink. He is believed to have been given this punishment for having abused divine favor by revealing to mortals the secrets he had learned in heaven. The use of the word tantalize is derived from this story and is indicative of having a desire that cannot be fulfilled. When we take for consideration the Prometheus bound of Aeschylus, Prometheus unbound by Percy Shelley, or the modern Prometheus subtitle of his wife Mary's book, Frankenstein, the story is forever the same. It is the law of self-sacrifice that delivers us both individually and collectively to a world resplendent in peace and love. In the midst of America's civil war, President Lincoln said, fellow citizens, we cannot escape history. The same, of course, is true today. Whether we consider a global pandemic or our worsening climate crisis, it is only concerted and unified action that can deliver us from catastrophe. Let us each take what we can from the example of Prometheus to do our part toward a better world. The story of Prometheus is not just about examples of our ancient past and our attempts to emulate a worthy example. As the poet William Blake said, God becomes as we are that we may be as he is. 
HPB alludes to this role when she writes, the Promethean myth is a prophecy indeed, but it does not relate to any of the cyclic saviors who have appeared periodically in various countries and among various nations in the transitionary conditions of evolution. It points to the last of the mysteries of cyclic transformations in the series of which mankind having passed from the ethereal to the solid physical state, from spiritual to physiological procreation is now carried onward on the opposite arc of the cycle toward that second phase of its primitive state when woman be, knew no man and human progeny was created, not begotten. And that's found in the Secret Doctrine, volume two, page 415. In a more universal context, HPB writes a few pages later, there is one eternal law in nature, one that always tends to adjust contraries and to produce final harmony. It is owing to this law of spiritual development, superseding the physical and purely intellectual, that mankind will become freed from its false gods and find itself finally self-redeemed. Secret Doctrine, Volume 2, page 420. Oh, that a man's reach should exceed his grasp. It is said that one should ever think of growing and never being full grown. This necessary aspect of the human condition, a state of becoming rather than being, is illustrated by the short story, A Dream of Wild Bees, by the South African writer, Olive Schreiner. In this tale, an expectant mother dreams of bees who, who offer gifts to her unborn child. Of the last of these, she writes, about the mother's head, the bees were flying, touching her with their long tapering limbs. And in her brain picture, out of the shadow of the room, came one with sallow face, deep lined, the cheeks drawn into hollows and a mouth smiling quiveringly. He stretched out his hand and the mother drew back and cried, who are you? He answered nothing. And she looked up between his eyelids and she said, what can you give the child health? And he said, the man I touch, there awakes up in his blood a burning fever that shall lick his blood as fire. That fever I will give him shall be cured when his life is cured. You give wealth? He shook his head. The man whom I touch, when he bends to pick up gold, he sees suddenly a light over his head in the sky. While he looks up to see it, the gold slips from between his fingers, or sometimes another passing takes it from him. Fame? He answered, not likely. For the man I touch, there is a path traced out in the sand by a finger which no man sees. That he must follow. Sometimes it leads almost to the top and then turns down suddenly into the valley. He must follow it, though none else sees the tracing. Love, he said, he shall hunger for it, but he shall not find it. When he stretches out his arms to it and would lay his heart against a thing he loves, then far off along the horizon, he shall see a light play. He must go towards it. The thing he loves will not journey with him. He must travel alone. When he presses somewhat to his burning heart, crying, mine, mine, my own, he shall hear a voice, renounce, renounce, this is not thine. He shall succeed? He said, he shall fail. 
When he runs with others, they shall reach the goal before him. For strange voices call to him, and strange lights shall beckon him. And he must wait and listen. And this shall be the strangest. Far off, across the burning sands, where to other men there is only the desert's waste, he shall see a blue sea. On that sea, the sun shines always, and the water is blue as burning amethyst, and the foam is white on the shore. A great land rises from it, and he shall see upon the mountaintops burning gold. The mother said, he shall reach it, and he smiled curiously. She said, is it real? And he said, what is real? And she looked between the half-closed eyelids and said, touch. And he leaned forward and laid his hand upon the sleeper and whispered to it, smiling. And this only she heard, this shall be thy reward that the ideal shall be real to thee. And the child trembled, but the mother slept on heavily and her brain picture vanished. But deep within the antenatal thing that lay here <clears throat> had a dream in those eyes that had never seen the day in that half shaped brain was the sensation of light, light it never had seen, light that perhaps it never should see, light that existed somewhere, and already it had its reward. The ideal was real to it. Thank you. Thank you.